This is Lars Leidesen of the um, Silicon Laboratories, if I'm correct? Yes, Silicon Laboratories in uh, Norway. And he is the head of the security office, and they are making chips for uh, smart devices in homes. And the, his talk is about how you commission them on a network and all the risks that go with that and all the, yeah, everything that can go wrong with that and how you should solve it. So he'll have a talk on that. So enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for coming. It's uh, quite an interesting time of day to have such a te technical topic. But I'm, I'm also proud to be able to give this presentation uh, at two different dates. So it's the first time I, I give a presentation that actually lasts formally for two two days. Um, commissioning methods for IoT. Who am I? Um, so uh, I used to be a quantum hacker. Quantum cryptography are these beautiful systems that deliver perfect security. Uh, but there are hundreds of them in the world. And, and they are used in real applications. Uh, and there will be a bit talk tomorrow by, uh, by Vadim, who's here uh, taking pictures for, at the moment, um, at 1.30. So you can go into depth on that. But since then, I changed uh, hats. And now I'm working for silicon laboratories that make uh, connectivity chips. So I'm, uh, instead of securing some hundreds of very expensive systems, I'm uh, securing billions of very cheap systems. And what's going on? What's happening with the world? Well, in the classical cybersecurity spa uh, space, uh, our house used to look like this. And soon it looks like this, with all kinds of wireless protocols in all of these devices. And there are a few big issues with that. And the attack surface for a hacker has increased. It has exploded since all of these are now connected, and many of them talk several different protocols. And accessibility to hardware is becoming a big problem, because suddenly the hackers can now have the device in their hands, and from being used to having secure IP connection, you actually have to be concerned about someone cracking open the device and starting to look inside the chip. And people are doing that, looking inside our chips. And the limited processing power in end nodes. So basically, I usually say I don't want my light bulbs to have to run antivirus. So is this an issue? So uh, we are actually, I'm, I'm working in Norway, but the, the headquarters is in Texas. So I like to kind of uh, talk uh, about things that resonate with, with Texans. And guns really resonate with the uh, Texans. So this is actually a, a female hacker in Norwegian. This was on Black Cat two years ago. Uh, who have heard about this uh, rifle hack before? The, the bear guys in the back? Um, so, so basically, this is a rifle, a smart rifle, where you aim, and then you push a button when you have what you want to hit inside. And then when you push the trigger, it will fire automatically when it's perfectly positioned. And then they could hack it over the Wi-Fi connection. So when you aim at this person here, you actually shot this person here by changing the calibration. So that's from one female uh, Norwegian hacker, and this is to another one. Uh, this says, um, network in the heart. So basically, um, a lot of people ask me, why do anyone hack a medical device? My answer is typically because it's a security expert that gets a medical device inside of them, and they say, hey, is, does this thing have connectivity? So this was a Norwegian uh, hacker that got a pacemaker and actually figured out there was insecure wireless interfaces to it. And this is why Dick Cheney got a special pacemaker without wireless interfaces. And typically, I, and I encourage to take the debate afterwards, if you had a pacemaker, would you want open or closed source? To me, that's the ultimate question of open versus closed source, uh, because uh, it's a life or death question. And of course, the Mirai botnet attack uh, has really put IoT security on, uh, on the agenda at the authorities. And two days ago, there was a legislation proposal in the US 
that any federal uh, building, when they buy IoT devices, they have to have a minimum security level. So this is moving into regulation at this point. Uh, it's going slower than it should, but it's actually happening. Okay, I'm going to skip this one. So, so when we talk about commissioning, we have to talk about attackers. So w what's the commissioning problem? The commissioning problem is when you have uh, a device and you want to put it on your network and you need to exchange credentials. So somehow, once you have a password that you can use to secure the link, the securing the link is trivial. That's not where most of the hacks happen. Most of the hacks in this space happen when the keys are exchanged. So we have passive attackers that only listen, and then we have the active attackers that do man-in-the-middle attacks. So basically, when the communicating parties, typically Alice and Bob, try to communicate, someone is sitting in the middle and intercept and resend and modify all the information that's sent. And if we look at the IoT wireless protocols, what is that? Well, typically I mentioned Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, and Thread. Sig who here has heard about Zigbee? Okay, this is uh, very impressive. And who here has heard about Thread? Okay, yeah, that's... So Thread is kind of the next generation Zigbee uh, with IP connectivity. It's also a mesh protocol, but it's IP connectable. And typically what we talk about when we see a lot of the big new, uh, news stories, um, some of them used to be vulnerable to passive attackers, but then we talk about, yeah, they're pretty secure against active attackers, disregarding man in the middle during commissioning. So we're kind of, all the time, we're just putting the real problem under the rug. So the commissioning problem, how do you secure the link? How Alice and Bob, they need somehow to get a secret key, the link key or the network key. And that's typically happening when you put a device on the network. What we all know is when we take our laptop home and we type in the, the, the password to the router. This is one way of distributing the key. And this is actually a real problem, not only, uh, only a theoretical problem at this point. So there was this um, story this spring, and, and now it's, it's resurfaced again, where someone could, uh, could ha make a worm that spread from light bulb to light bulb over these Philips Hue smart bulbs. These were Zigbee bulbs. And to steal other bulbs, so, so what the worm wants to do, it wants to replicate itself into new bulbs. It exploited our issue in the, in the um, commissioning protocol. And why could this happen? Well, it's because security and privacy is a, uh, a balancing act. So security and ease of use and functionality is at conflict. And that, to me, I mean, the Philips Hue guys actually do an amazing job of securing their product. But the problem is that my mother needs to be able to buy a light bulb and get it on the network. And if that's really hard, she won't buy that light bulb. So what do you do? OK, so I'm going to kind of give you an overview of the commissioning schemes that exist and kind of a little bit uh, the, the, um, the traits of each of them so you know which one to pick. And the first one is what we call permissive schemes. And basically, you just send the key over the link. It's easy as that. You say, OK, I accept a reduced security when the commissioning happens or when my mother brought the light bulb home. Perhaps there is a window that's risky, but OK, we accept that. So we do it in the clear, or we can send it encrypted, authenticated with a well-known key, <laughs> which kind of, to a security researcher, sounds silly. But this is actually what's going on in a lot of protocols. I feel like I have to mention it. And you can use public key cryptography uh, to secure it. Uh, so at least then you're secure against passive attackers, but not against active attackers. It can also be improved by temporal filtering. So this is uh, like you can only do the commissioning at a certain time when you push a button. There is a window commission within one, one minute or spatial filtering, which is what a lot of these do where the devices need to be physically close to each other to be able to commission. So that can be an okay solution. Like NFC, near field communication is using that and also saying, okay, if, uh, if I'm at home, and I'm commissioning uh, two devices, and I know they're in my living room, perhaps that's acceptable. 
perhaps it's acceptable that I think that the hacker is not outside with a powerful antenna at that time. I won't go through public key, key exchange because I assume you know that already. So to summarize, permissive is very easy to use. There is no UI requirements, so it's not like my IoT device needs a button or a screen or anything, because it's just, it just accepts any connection. And there are minimal operational requirements. Like when I produce the device, I don't have to insert any secrets into it, so it's very easy to produce. And it works offline, which is increasingly a requirement. But the level of security is really low. And in many cases, this is a trade-off that the companies are willing to do. Then we have shared key, where from somewhere, this key is coming to both Alice and Bob. And this is the scheme in the Wi-Fi router. You type the password in the router, and you type the password on the computer. So you're kind of manually carrying the key around. And there are many ways of doing this. Uh, you can have the key printed on the node. You can have QR codes to make it more efficient. Um, one of the big issues with this is that it uh, kind of en uh, encourages short keys. Like most people I know, they, they have a super short, easy to remember key on their Wi Fi just because of convenience. So there are ways to, to make long keys efficient if you want to use this scheme, like QR codes, or you can use something called JPEG which is a, a fancy protocol where you can have very short keys at e both ends, but still make it very resistant against brute force. And of course, again, temporal filtering, filtering and spatial filtering. So shared key can provide good security, and it works offline, but it requires user interaction, typically, and it requires a, a user interface and it can motivate insufficient key lengths, and there is operational complexity. And, and that's something that, that sounds simple, but we hear again and again about router producers that make a default password via some algorithm, and the algorithm comes out, and then suddenly it turns out that all the passwords leaked simultaneously. So the operational, my, my advice is always don't underestimate how operationally hard it is to inject secrets into every device. It sounds like this, this, this is well known, it's just engineering, but it's still uh, non-trivial to do. The last way of doing this is certificate-based, where the, the parties pre-share uh, pre um, public keys. And this way, they can actually properly authenticate each other via uh, public key cryptography. Um, and there is a lot of flexibility here. Once you have the public keys, you can grant rights, you can do certificate chains, you can do a lot of very sophisticated things. Um, and it's, it's, so it's the perfect flexible security. There is no user interaction, but there is a significant operational complexity, much more complicated than, uh, than uh, the other schemes. It may not work offline, and it requires more resources on the devices. So on a small device, you might not have the computational power to do public key cryptography. And someone here asked me how, how are, um, if you look at many of the big vendors, you are now getting in a position where, like if I order something from Amazon, it already connects with my home, and that's because they have the operational proficiency to do this. Okay, so this is just uh, a summary. Permissive is bad security, and super on everything else. Certificate is great on everything but operational requirements, because it's just hard to do, to distribute all these certificates. And shared key can do, can, is somewhere in the middle. So in protocols, Wi-Fi, this is the well-known that we all use. It's a shared key method. Um, and then, of course, that was very hard. So they made this VPS which is a permissive scheme where you push this button on each device, and then suddenly, magically, they work together. The problem with that is, uh, is it must support an eight-pin or eight-digit pin entry mode, which has turned out to be insecure. So VPS is simply not recommended. It's, it's insecure, but simple. And then VPA Enterprise is, is a certificate-based method. Um, the biggest challenge 
is that it's often not supported by Internet of Things devices, simply. So the problem is, if I set up my gateway to support uh, VPA Enterprise, most of my IoT devices will not be able to connect with it today. Bluetooth, um, it has had, so I'm only referring to Bluetooth after version 4.2. And then it has been public key based. And what the Bluetooth committee did was they put a few standard methods based on the UI on each side. So you have something called just works, that's a permissive method. That just works. And then there is a numeric comparison. Basically, if you have the ability to compare digits on each screen. And this is what happens in your car. When you connect your phone, it will say, your phone will say a six digit number, and then your screen on your car will say a six digit number, and you're asked to compare them. So this is a shared key scheme. And then there is a pass key entry uh, where you actually enter the six digit number. And then all of these protocols support what's called auto band, where it means you just make, roll your own, figure a way to get the key to each device. And then based on what you have, uh, you can have this different scheme. So if you have a keyboard on each end, then you can do a pass key. If you have no input and no output on any device, well, then it only just works because you can't interact with the device at all. If you have display only and a keyboard, you can do pass key, etc. So this is like a matrix that can give you the highest level of security based on what UI elements you have on each end. Zigbee has a lot of different uh, variants here. Um, one of the issues is, is that it's permissive and it's using a fixed key. So basically, there is a secret or should be a secret Zigbee key that uh, is used to encrypt the other keys. The problem is that that key has, of course, leaked. So, so basically, you're, you, you should think of it as sending your keys in the clear. Uh, now Zigbee 3.0 has come and it has extra options. It has something called install codes where you pre-share you keys per node in the mesh network. Uh, I think uh, at proximity window, so you have to be close. It uses RSSI. It's not perfect, but it works. And then Zigbee Smart Energy, which is used in Smart Grid, uses public key-based schemes. Thread is IP enabled, so this, this uh, allows end-to-end -end connections with, with uh, IP connected devices. It uses secret keys, but it uses this JPEG to make significantly longer uh, or increase security level. So even if the keys are short, you get a high security level. And then DTLS is used to secure the link during commissioning, so you have to, it leans on DTLS as well. And then out of band. Out of band is just this magic way you f that the key comes from somewhere. So you can roll your own basically. Uh, and, and two typical schemes we see is one standard to commission another. So someone will use Bluetooth to commission a light bulb, and then it jumps to a mesh protocol afterwards. Um, and NFC is something where physical proximity is supposed to, to be uh, working well. The challenge with uh, NFC is that, um, like in a light bulb setting, it might not be easy to kind of get physical proximity. So, so that's like, it's both a pro and a con in this, in this setting. Let's see. Okay, hold on. So final remarks. So commissioning re is really a, a challenging trade-off between security, usability, and operational complexity. It's really where the rubber hits the road in terms of, of IoT security. And there are several schemes, permissive, shared key, certificate-based. And almost all the wireless standards support different methods. And in general, this also provides interoperability. So and all the standards support auto ban. So every standard can be made secure if you want to. And then don't roll your own scheme unless you have to, and especially for, for a protocol, because uh, it's hard to do this right. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. okay thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? 
Wait a moment. Uh, what I would like to ask is, um, what, what, so in your chips, what kind of protocol do you use? Uh, so we support all of these uh, protocols. All of them. So okay. we have both Bluetooth, uh, uh, Zigbee, Thread, um, and Wi-Fi chips. OK, and is there any you prefer? Or uh, that's, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. So in a home automation, uh, I would prefer Thread. If I was building a house, I would want Thread devices. But they are not on the market yet, so then it's Zigbee. If it's connecting to my phone, uh, Bluetooth is the natural choice. Okay. And if it's at home and or you require a lot of data, high data rate, then Zigbee. No, sorry, Wi-Fi would be the natural choice. OK. I see someone over there. Please ask your question. So, Lars, are you kind of happy with the situation with the available uh, options and protocols? Or is there anything significant that could be improved or maybe further research done to improve the available methods? It's a very, it's a very good uh, question. Can you repeat so, the question? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so, are there any ways to improve this? What, what's the situation? And are there any ways, any research that could be done? Um, it's a good question. I think the most important aspect is to get sec good security in the standards itself, which sounds trivial, but actually is not. So that, that's, uh, that's on one hand. We have public key cryptography, so we have the fundamental building blocks. Um, yeah, I don't know, perhaps uh, regulation or some major entity could do something in this space. Kind of like we have the domain name uh, or, or the names, um, the DNS uh, companies. And, and um, I'm not saying that a it's a good solution, but at least uh, some central authority might be able to, to provide a route of trust into this. OK. Um, I believe with uh, Wi-Fi, you were explaining that you could use certificates. Yes. And that with that you would share uh, to exchange a shared key, but wouldn't it be more logical that the ones you have certificates, you just use them to establish a session? And ah, yes. Sorry. So the Wi-Fi can have several modes, and uh, when you use certificates, you can use that to establish a session, if if you have that. Okay. So the question is. Is there additionally also the mode where you do use the certificates only to exchange a shared key, or that is not officially a mode? It should be possible via the out-of-band scheme in VPS. So also Wi-Fi allows you to supply the key from somewhere. And then you could have your own, roll your own certificate-based scheme. OK, okay. are there any more, qu any more questions? No? Okay, then I'd like another applause for a speaker. Mm.